My name is Ali Chima uh, and I'm a research fellow at the Center for Economic Research in Pakistan. I'm an economist by training. So I think Shazia's story is important. Uh, first of all, because you know there, there's a lot of investment going in to give better opportunities to people like Shazia, right? So if you don't know their story, and particularly the constraints that they face in their daily lives while designing that investment, you're going to throw money, right, uh, but not affect lives of people like Shazia. So, so I think the story is powerful because it should kind of wake up everybody to say it's not just enough to supply opportunities, it's also important to design them in a way where the people who have to access them are able to access them. This is a public program that is funded by DFID and the government of Punjab. And one of the part, one of the commitments of the program was to give women access to skills training in uh, four poor districts, four of the poorest districts in Pakistan. Um, the the program's uh, initial assumption was that this would be very difficult because patriarchy is very strong. Uh, so we were engaged to really, first of all, create evidence on demand, whether demand existed amongst women. Um, and our initial evidence showed that there was considerable demand amongst households to train their women. But then when the program opened up and, and gave women free training, an opportunity for free training with money thrown in on the top with stipends to defray costs, what we found was very few women within the population took up that offer. Um, so that kind of suggested to us that the, the important problem here is not one of demand or patriarchy that exists, but one of access. Um, and I think this is an important problem to take seriously because this is a pro problem that exists in a bunch of other women's programs like girls' schooling, or access to cash transfers, um, health uh, services for women. This research is interesting um, in terms of two perspectives. Uh, I mean, we, we know that in a number of developing countries, and that includes Pakistan, that uh, women's enfranchisement and women's empowerment is a big challenge um, in a host of dimensions, whether it's in terms of accessing uh, public programs or it's in terms of actually going in and participating in the labor force and or going in and exercising their right to vote. Um, in each of these dimensions, while we know that this problem exists, we really don't have a very good idea about what is causing the problem to exist in the first place. Now when it comes to designing public policy problems, if you think that the problem is driven by a wrong cause and invest massive amounts of money trying to fix that cause, that the problem might still stay the same. Um, in Pakistan's case, basically we've had about 20 to 30 years of a lot of experimentation, both within government and led by multilateral and bilateral donors. Um, and yet, this problem is being resolved at a very, very slow pace. So I think uh, diagnosing the problem, but working with a partner who's in the big business of fixing it, um, can actually increase both the impact of public investment, but also help us move the outcome that I think we in Pakistan and generally the globe cares about a lot. Um, I, I think that, first of all, you know, we have to be clear that mobility kind of can embed uh, a set of different constraints in it. So it's, it's not just the act of, or the, or the cost of, of going from point A to point B, right? It's not, you know, paying the bus fare, that's the problem, or the bus being there, that's the problem. But kind of mobility um, has within it a set of kind of social constraints. So like I said, that constraint could be you know, freedom within one's community of residence, uh, which is a village. 
uh, but you know it becoming costly once you cross the boundary of the village. Now that's a social constraint. Uh, access drops by uh, quite a large amount uh, at the boundary of the village. So when women have to cross the boundary of the village, it becomes very socially costly for them. Um, now, in some sense, this is not surprising. This is uh, something that people who've been working on gender issues in Pakistan have been writing about. But we've never had uh, objective evidence uh, about this claim. Um, and that kind of crossing the boundary effect is, is, is huge. What I'd like policymakers to take away from this research is that they do have the tools to really um, remove the constraints which are affecting women from participating in a whole range of activities. If you truly are able to address the mobility issue, what, what you're going to see is that uh, you know, Pakistan's uh, labor force uh, uh, patterns are going to change tremendously. Uh, I think it's going to become much easier for women to um, access labor market opportunities uh, and fulfill you know, their lives in terms of uh, you know, work uh, and what they care about. I think what, what you'll start to get is those patterns changing um, and that's going to have a big impact on the social fabric uh, of this country.